So recently, during your workforce message we, that we sent out last week, you mentioned the top lines of a two-week review about commercial op options for the Orion. Can you give us some more details of that the review? Okay, so the, uh, the review of commercial options for the first launch of Orion around the moon. Uh, so good, good question. Um, this could take a little bit of time, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to put it in a nutshell. Here, here's the thing. The SLS with an Orion crew capsule and a European service module was intended to launch in December of this year, December of 19, with a no later than date of, of June of 2020. Um, that slipped significantly uh, based on a brief that I got from Boeing and others. And since that slipped significantly, and we're trying to, to accelerate, I said, okay, we're going to look at all the options. What is the trade space to put Orion around the moon with the European service module and test it? The goal here is, is to test it. And if we were to do that commercially, then we would still have that first SLS for a launch uh, in the future that could put some kind of habitation module, maybe you know, whatever else might, we, we might want to put in orbit around the moon as part of the gateway. That first SLS would still be available. That was the intent. Now, here's the thing. We looked at those options very carefully over a period of two weeks, and there's a lot of people that got no sleep for two weeks because I tasked them with this. So thank you, number one, for doing that work. Here's what we learned. Number one, a Delta IV Heavy um, is not, it, it cannot launch a, a, an Orion crew capsule with a European service module to orbit. It just doesn't have the throw weight capable of doing that. So I, I asked, what about an ICPS? Can we put an interim cryogenic propulsion stage? Well, actually, no, you can't. Why? Because that weighs it down even more. So it still prevents it from getting to orbit. So then the question was, what about two Delta IV heavies? Can you launch an ICPS on a Delta IV heavy and another you know, Delta IV heavy with the Orion crew capsule and the European service module? The answer is yes, you can launch both of them. The problem is we only have one launch pad on each coast for a Delta IV heavy. And by the way, we don't have any extra Delta IV heavies sitting around, so we'd have to steal those rockets from another agency, two of them. So we looked at that and we said, okay, well, is it physically possible if, if we had the support to take rockets from other places? And the answer was, yes, it's physically possible. Here's the problem. When you launch one from the East Coast and one from the West Coast, the one on the West Coast can only launch polar because you can't launch it east over the United States from the West Coast. So when you launch a polar orbit, now you have to switch orbits when you're in orbit around the Earth. Which that takes a ton of delta V. And it takes a ton of time. That's the big problem is the time. Because if, if, and I don't want to say what that time is, but it's enough time to where you're going to have cryogenic boil off, and then you're not going to be able to accomplish the objective anyway. So two delta fours proved to be unworkable. So then we said, what about a delta four and a Falcon Heavy? Or, even better, let's pretend the two delta fours worked. We don't have any way to do automatic rendezvous and docking. That the capability does not exist in our country except for one solution, which is a crew dragon which we just proved on the International Space Station. So, okay, let's take a Crew Dragon and dock it to the Orion and push it around the moon. We'll launch the Crew Dragon on a, on a Falcon, and we'll launch the Orion and European Service Module on Delta IV Heavy. Can we do that? Put them both on the pad. By the way, I was for it, because the visuals would be beautiful. Can we put both <laughs> of them on the pad at the same time, launch them an hour and a half apart, one orbit apart, and get that done? Here's the problem. While the Crew Dragon is capable of doing automatic rendezvous and docking, it doesn't have the thrust to throw it around the moon. So it would be basically be a replay of EFT-1, which isn't what we're trying to achieve here. We want to test it around the moon. So then we said, OK, can we, can we use any other kind of upper stage? And, and here's, here's a solution that did work. Uh, a, a Falcon Heavy with a, a regular old Falcon upper stage and an Orion and a European service module. That actually did work on one rocket. Here's the problem. There is a whole host of challenges that had to be addressed. We talk about a, a Falcon uh, being launched. You know, everything is integrated horizontally, and then the erector arm makes it vertical. Well, you put an upper stage with a European service module and an Orion on top of that. Making it vertical is extremely difficult. It would take a lot of changes uh, to that erector arm. By the way, then, then the, the, the European service module would not have any of the hypergolics on it. So now you have to load the hypergolics in the vertical, which means that the launch pad itself would have huge 
changes that it would need to be that would need to be made. On top of it all, we're talking about putting a massive fairing on top of a, 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 a on top of a Falcon Heavy, and that massive fairing, of course, is going to create some kind of shock wave as it goes through max Q, and those shock waves are going to impact the side boosters on a Falcon Heavy in ways that right now we we don't even know. Which means we got to go back into wind tunnel testing. At the end of the day, while that option was attractive and possible, there was so much risk and so much cost and so much schedule involved that it wouldn't accelerate on either cost or schedule. But here's the thing. It could be used in the future if we could get through all of that. The one downside of that is that it barely made it around the moon. It is true we could get around the moon, but it would be a free return trajectory and there'd be no, no possible way to insert at the moon into an orbit not even a near rectilinear halo orbit, which is, of course, where the gateway would be. So even that capability was limited. That was not the right solution either. I know we're getting short on time, and this is more detail, but I think there's people here that are interested in this. At the end, there is another solution out there, a Falcon Heavy with an ICPS at the top. Talk about strange bedfellows. A Falcon Heavy with an ICPS at the top with, an, with a European service module and Orion crew capsule, that ultimately has the ability to put us to potentially, gosh, Gerst is going to be so mad at me for saying all this. <laughs> but at the end of the day, by the way, none of this was cleared by Gerst and Meyer. He's still the best rocket scientist that we have. Um, no, no insult <laughs> to anybody else in the room. Um, so going, going back to, to, at the end of the day, there, there is a solution here that could potentially work for the future. It would require time, it would require cost, and there is risk involved. But guess what? If we're going to land boots on the moon in 2024, we have time, and we have the ability to accept some risk, make some modifications. All of that is on the table. There is nothing sacred here that is off the table. And that is a, that is a potential capability that could help us land boots on the moon in 2024. I don't want to take away for one second the best option to get us to the lunar orbit as soon as possible is SLS and an Orion with the European service module. There is nothing that beats that capability and right now what we're doing is everything possible to accelerate that. So instead of doing things in series, we're doing things in parallel. I'm, gonna, I'm sorry I'm going to anchor here. We've got some time. We've got 15 more minutes. Here, and by the way, when I went one minute over, when I did the budget rollout, they chopped me off on time. So I'm going to end <laughs> right on time. They just did a hard cutoff. So I'm going to make sure that I don't do that again. Don't go over time on NASA TV. They will cut you off. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter if you're the administrator or not. They're cutting you off. Um, so the SLS and the Orion crew capsule, the European service module is the best solution. We have to accelerate the SLS. How do we make that happen? The engine section ended up in the critical path. That's what happened. The engine section, and everything has to be stacked on top of the engine section. So given the property, plant, and equipment that we had, we were stuck on the engine section, and we can't integrate um, the, the hydrogen tank with the oxygen tank, the inner tank, and the fairings. They couldn't be integrated with the engine section. So what did we do? We just bought hardware that's going to help us integrate horizontally all of those components for an eventual one, so in other words, we can continue working on the rest of the rocket while the engine section is caught in the critical path. That's going to accelerate our schedule by a number of months in a very positive way. Then what we're looking at is ultimately how much testing do we have to do. We don't want to do anything that is absolutely not necessary. There's a lot of tests that we'd like to do, a lot of tests that we would love to see the result of. And we talk about a flight envelope. We want to test it at every single part of that flight envelope in the extreme. Friends, the question is, what, is it, what does it take to be qualified to fly? Not, we don't have to test everything to failure. What does it take to be qualified to fly? Those are the ultimate the questions that we need to answer. And if we can accelerate, whether it's the green run test, um, we have other capabilities. We're talking about space shuttle main engines here. These are RS-25s. They've got millions of seconds of test on top of 130 shuttle flights with three engines each. That's a lot of flight time on these engines. Now they have digital controllers. Digital controllers enable them to, to accept very high off-nominal uh, fluid flows, whether it's liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen. So the question is, how much off-nominal can they accept? And it's possible that we could descope some of the green run based on the fact that we now have these new capabilities, digital control, 
which are important. I used to fly airplanes that had digital electronic controls, what we called it, DEC, um, and it made a world of difference. Uh, uh, again, I'm not saying that an airplane is the same as a rocket. I get it. It's different. And all the rocket engineers are like, yeah, an airplane, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but it does help. It makes a big difference. And I think it's important for us to understand that um, it might not be necessary. Again, I'm taking nothing off the table, and we're not going to compromise safety, going back to a previous question. But the question is, what do we need to do? And anything we don't need to do, we can delay. There's future launches, there's future things we can test, but right now, how do we get boots on the moon in 2024? That's our focus. Thanks for the question. Great. We're going to take one.